Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Just want to say thanks to Dan and David for the invitation to come and be on this lectureship. I've already enjoyed it. I enjoyed it even more when he said I'm under 30 years of age. Yeah, I'm 29, so this is the last year for that, so I want to soak it all in. Yeah, it's great. Appreciate you coming, and this has been a great series of lectures. Already heard BJ speak last night and Brother Haynes, and looking forward to talking with you about questions from the Bible, especially the one that I have, and we'll go to Exodus chapter 4 in just a moment. But I want to talk to you about a young girl named Juliana. That's her name. Now, the news reporters credited her quick thinking with what saved her life. Her and her family were out in Orlando in 2017 at Moss Park, and she was in what they called the designated swim area when, out of nowhere, this alligator grabbed hold of her leg and wouldn't let go. And she says, at nine years old, she began to beat this alligator on top of the head as best she could. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let go. And she thought quickly about what she remembered seeing at an uh, exhibit in Gatorland. And she said, you know, they told her if you take two fingers and stick it up the alligator's nose, he won't be able to breathe. And so in having to breathe and struggle for air, he would open his mouth. And she did that. And he opened his mouth, and she got her leg out, and her family rescued her. And so she could say at nine years old, she defeated an alligator with her bare hands. We sometimes sing a song about God to young children. He has the whole world in his what? And that's true, but he's put a lot of it in ours. And so Psalm 8 and verse 4 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? You've made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor, and you've set him over the works of your hands. May we never underestimate all that God has put into our care is his human creation. He's put it into our hands. The word hand appears over 1,800 times in your English translation. Most times it's simply dealing with this, the human entity. And so in the book of Judges, chapter 5, we're told that J.L. took her hand and drove a peg through a man's head. Or Nehemiah 4, 17, Nehemiah says he had adversaries on each side. And so as he and his co-workers worked to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem, it took him 52 days to do it. But Nehemiah 4, 17 says they had a sword in one hand and a working tool in the other. Sometimes what humanity does is called the works of their hands. And so Psalm 90 and verse 17, Moses says, bless the work of my hands. And Lamentation 4 and verse 2, Jeremiah uses this same thing. The things that humanity does, he calls it the work of our hands. I know we're finite, and there are so very few things under our control, but there are some things we can control. And God has allowed us to use the hands that he's given us to do many of those things. Go ahead and turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, and this is where our question starts. Now, when you get to the book of Exodus, you run into a man by the name of Moses. Moses is one of those unique characters in the Bible. Everybody's in the Bible because God wanted them there, but Moses is special. It said in Exodus 33, verse 11, and also in Deuteronomy 34, 10, and 11, Moses had a special relationship with God. There arose not a prophet in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He talked with God as a man talks with his friends. Moses was special. He spent his first 40 years of his life in the palace in Egypt, in Pharaoh's home, but he knew his roots. And so Hebrews 11:25 says he left the pleasures of sin that only last for a season and he found himself in Midian with his father Jethro tending his sheep. And in Exodus chapter 3 God appears to him. You remember in verse 14 and 15, I want you to go down and talk to Pharaoh and have him let my people go and when they say who sent you, you are to tell them that I am that I am. And God knew that Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go easily. And so he says in Exodus 3, 17 through 20, it'll only be with a strong hand that he will let you go. And by the way, that hand would be the hand of Moses. God would work through Moses' hands to do signs and wonders to let his people go. But Moses, like many of us, he had a lot of excuses on why he couldn't do what God wanted him to do. And so chapter 4 begins with some of, those, some of those things that Moses puts back at God, some of those questions about how can this be done? What, are the, what am I going to say? What if the people don't listen to me or hearken to my voice? What if they don't obey? And what if they even say this, verse 1 of Exodus 4, the Lord hasn't appeared to you. And God says to Moses in verse 2, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And the remainder of this chapter, or at least part of it, is God using Moses' hands and showing him a plethora of signs. You remember, put your hand into your bosom or into your coat, and it's leprous like snow, and then put it back in, and it becomes whole. He throws the rod down and picks it up, and it becomes a snake. And he tells Moses, 
In Exodus 4 and verse 17, you are going to do signs and wonders with this rod and you will overthrow Pharaoh and the Egyptian empire and then he'll let my people go. Moses had no clue. I don't think he did. That the rod that he held in his hand that was once used simply to herd sheep and do the business of his father-in-law would be the same rod that he would use to perform signs with his brother Aaron and would ultimately overthrow the Egyptian empire. And in Exodus 14, he would hold up his hands and they would walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. Moses did those things with the hands. The hands that he had that he didn't think he could do anything with when he said to God, they won't believe me. And God says, yes, they will. You'll do signs and you'll show them who I am. There have been other people in scripture who have done great things with their hands. You might remember some of these. God has always made much of men's hands. Now, in our hands, most things are small objects. We don't think anything of it. But these are some examples of times when God has used his servants and used things that they had in their possession to do great things. Think about in the book of Judges, Shamgar. You remember he had an ox goat? It's not much of a war weapon, is it? But with divine power back in it, it makes all the difference. And so in Judges 3 and verse 31, we're told he slew 600 Philistines with that ox gold. Or you might think later on in the book of Judges, that's the wrong verse, by the way. It should be Judges 7, 15 through 23. Gideon and his soldiers, they go with him to 300. And I don't know what you would do with trumpets, pitchers, and lamps in a battle today. But in the days of Gideon, they rise up and they say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they run the Midianites out of town. You see, all they had in their hands were these small objects, but with divine power back in them, it made all the difference. What about the young boy in John chapter 6? Even Jesus' disciples struggled with how we're going to feed this multitude. And Jesus said, what do you have? Might have said, what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your possession? And they said, we don't have anything. But one of the disciples said, a boy is here. He has five loaves and two small fish. And Jesus fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men on a bag boy's lunch. And then who can forget about the widow? In Mark chapter 12, we're told Jesus sat over against the treasury and watched how the people cast in. And the people that were wealthy, they cast in much out of their possession. But this poor widow, she threw in two mites, even all her living. And Jesus praised her and told his disciples, wherever the gospel is preached, people are going to see this woman's example and what she did in casting in all her living. She gave more than all the others. You see, in her hand were two mites. And it changed the world, and she would be forever remembered in holy writ for what she did. What is that in your hand? What do we have? You might say, well, I can't do much. And maybe we have these excuses or this mindset that says, I'm just a finite person. I'm on earth for a little time. And what can I do with my hands? We're limited. I understand that. But God has given us some things that we need to make sure that we use in the right way. And there are other things in our hands that we need to make sure that we release. And so this afternoon and the time we have remaining. I want to talk to you about seven things that we either should or should not have in our hands, and then the lesson will be yours. Number one, what is that in your hand? I hope it's a towel in your hand. In John 13, Jesus takes his disciples to the upper room, and you remember John 13 and verse 5 says, he got that water basin, girded himself with a towel, and he got down and he washed the disciples' feet. And so John 13, 15, Jesus says, I've left you an example that as I've done you, you should do to one another. A servant is not above his master, neither is he that sent greater than the one that sent him. Verse 17, Jesus says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I don't know in John 13 who had foot washing duty that day, but I know it wasn't the Lord. I mean, he'd been trying to teach these individuals about how to be servants, how to be great in the kingdom. You remember in Matthew 20, they were arguing about who would be the greatest. In Matthew 20 and verse 27, Jesus says, And whosoever would be chief among you, let him be your what? Let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, that's how you are to be great. Be a servant. And though he had been with these men for three years and it taught them how to do this, it still didn't sink in. And so this is his last ditch effort to get servanthood into their hearts. He girds himself with a towel. He shouldn't be the one doing it, but he's the only one big enough to do this servant job. And so he says, this is how you ought to do it. Jesus is our example in servitude. Philippians 2 and verse 5, where Paul is teaching the Philippians about being servants. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. Things of heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Father, Paul says, be humble, be great. That's what Jesus was. What's that in your hand? I hope it's a towel. If we're too big to serve in God's kingdom, if we're too big to get on our knees and serve, then we're just too big for ourselves. Look at Romans 15 along these lines. Turn your Bible to Romans 15 and notice what Paul says. We should be the individuals that set the pace as we try to serve our neighbors because this is what Jesus taught us and we should have a towel in our hand. Now, I appreciate what Jesus does in John 13 wasn't necessarily special in those times. Jesus washed their feet, but people wash feet all the time. It was a customary way to show hospitality in the first century. That's not what made it special. What made what Jesus did special was Jesus says, this is how you get to the top in the kingdom of God. There was nothing inherently valuable about washing feet, but where Jesus turns the dial on this is he says, if you want to be great, this is how you do it. Most people would say, if you want to be great in business, you go and get an MBA from Harvard. What if a man said, if you want to be great in business, you start by becoming a trash man? That's what the disciples are facing when Jesus says, you start with a water basin. And so in Romans 15 and verse 1, Paul says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Can you serve someone? I was at a lectureship recently, and a man said his prayer to God every day is, show me whose feet I need to wash today. And he wasn't talking about literally washing feet. He was talking about the John 13 principle that says, I need to find somebody to serve. I need to do this for somebody else. And it doesn't have to be about me. In our world of give me my rights, me first, may it always be about me. The John 13 spirit, the person that has a towel in his or her hand that bows down to serve others and not have themselves serve. This is where we stand out among the world. So 1 Corinthians 10, 24 Paul told the Corinthian church who had a lot of problems with this idea about getting along, about being humble, let no man seek his own, but every man another's well. What's that in your hand? This afternoon, I hope there's a towel in your hand as you think about how can I be of service? You don't have to do the big job. You know, somebody had to hold those ropes in Acts 9 when they let Paul down in the basket. Somebody had to do that. Dorcas, her work when she made clothes for those widows in Acts 9, her work meant so much to the church that they sent for Simon Peter to come and raise her from the dead. We don't have to do a big thing for God, but we can do something. Number two, what's that in your hand? It's talent. There's talent in your hand. Now, I realize that we don't have the miraculous like they did in the first century. The miraculous abilities given in the first century served a few purposes. Number one, it confirmed the word. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 says that God gave those gifts to confirm the message that was preached. It also helped as the church was in its infancy until she came to full maturity with the completed revelation of God's word. And so they needed the miraculous gifts. And we don't have those today, but we do have the word and that's enough. But we do have talent. Look at Romans chapter 12 and notice what is said beginning in verse 4. Now, some of these are miraculous gifts and abilities, but not all. And so we have these same or we have some of these abilities today and not in the miraculous measure for sure. But look at verse 4. For as, many, as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Where the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorts on exhortation. He that gives, let him do with simplicity. He that rules with diligence. And he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. What is that in your hand? It's talent. God has gifted each of us uniquely with the ability to do certain things, and he hasn't done it for our own selfish reasoning or for our own selfish ambition. God has given us talent so that we might use it for his glory. Do you remember the parable of the talents, Matthew 25? Jesus tells a few parables there, and they're really all about stewardship. The individuals, the ten virgins, the wise and the foolish, and then he talks about the sheep and the goats, but in the middle of those two, there's the parable of the talents, the five-talent man, the two-talent man, and who's the last guy? The one talent man. There's no such thing as the zero talent man, is there? 
Now, these are measures of money. This isn't about ability as we're using it today, but these are measures of money, but the principle still applies. And so Jesus gives the five-talent man, or the master in the parable gives the five-talent man five talents, and you know what he does. He doubles those talents. And by the way, appreciate the fairness of the master. In Matthew 25, verse 15, it says, he gave them the talents according to their several ability, old King James says, or to their own ability. He didn't overwhelm the two-talent man with five talents or the one-talent man with three. He gave it each to them according to what they were able to do. And so the five-talent man received his five upon his master's return. You know what he said. Lo, you've given me these five talents. I've doubled them. Here is your return. And the two-talent man, he wasn't required to produce five or three when his master returned. You know what he had in his hand. He had two talents, and he said, here it is, it's yours. But the one-talent man, when his master returns, Luke's account says he had it folded up in a napkin and he gives it to his master and he says, I know you are a hard man laboring where you haven't sown and here you have what is yours. Appreciate all of his excuses. He was given what he could work with. But the first thing he does is he blames his master. He says, I know you're a hard man. Much like Adam in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 12, when God comes in the garden looking for Adam, you know what Adam says when he's confronted about his disobedience as well as his wife Eve? He blames God. That woman, that who gave me? He says, you gave me. Now in Genesis 2, he said, whoa, man, he was excited, right? But now it's the woman that God gave me. The second thing the one talent man does is he hides behind the shield of fear. He says, I was afraid. I know you gave me this talent, you trusted me with this ability, but I was afraid to do anything with it, and so I went and I, I hid it in the earth. Didn't Adam make a similar statement? Genesis 3, in verse 10, Adam said, when I saw that I was naked, I was afraid, and so I hid. But not only that, this individual, the one talent man, he tries to justify himself by saying, I haven't corrupted the talent. Here it is. I haven't manipulated it. You have it. It's yours. But what did his master say? What did Jesus say in Matthew 25, 26? You wicked and unprofitable servant. If you knew all of these things about me, you should have gone out and done what was wise with the talent. And upon my return, I would have had interest for what I've given you. What if he says that to us today about the talent he's placed in our hands, the ability that God has given us to go out and make his name known among the nations? In Matthew 5, in verse 16, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which art in heaven. God's given us talent and ability, not for our own selfish ambition, but so that we might glorify him before people. And they might say, I want to know more about your God based on the way that you and I carry ourselves. What's that in your hand? It's talent. It's ability. God hasn't given it to us so that we might hide it under a bushel and never use it. But to develop it and that he might have interest upon his return. You know, it seems innocent at first, but I read an article a few weeks ago about the danger of holding in a sneeze. You ever try to do that? holding in a sneeze. This article said you could rupture an eardrum if you hold it in long enough and even bust a blood vessel in your eye. If you just continue to hold in that sneeze, it's pretty dangerous. More dangerous than that is the individual that would hold in his or her talent. I don't know. What do we think? Our excuses are going to fare better than the one talent man. Jesus told a parable in Luke 14 in verse 18. He said a master had a great supper and he invited many individuals and they all with one consent begin to make excuse. God's blessed us in the greatest time to be alive as far as technology and advancement. The brightest minds, I'm persuaded, are in the Lord's kingdom and in his church. But sometimes we don't give God all that we should. The talent's in our hands, but God wants us to go out and multiply it and use it to his glory. On our jobs and in our communities, we are sometimes the most innovative and hardworking and engaged people that there are. But sometimes in the church, I'm disengaged, I'm absent, I'm apathetic, and I don't really want to go out and do much for the kingdom. I'd rather just sort of sit in the back. That's really not who I, but on my job and in other areas and civic duty. If anybody needs the brightest minds, it's God. If anybody needs the hands that are work, it's God's. And God wants us to be those things out in the world but surely he wants it in the kingdom as well. What did he call the Apostle Paul in Acts 9? He said, he is a chosen vessel for me. Saul had talent, and God wanted him to use it. Luke 14, 28 says, to whom much is given, 
much is going to be required. And of whom men bless abundantly, of those individuals do they require all the more. What's that in your hand? It is talent, and God has given it to you and to me so that we might glorify him with it. And he's going to come back and want to know what exactly have we done with it. Number three, what's that in your hand? It's influence. Go ahead and turn your Bible to 1 Thessalonians 1 and appreciate the big influence that the Thessalonians had in the first century. What's that in your hand? It is the power to influence. The Thessalonians are unique. Like the Philippians, Paul praises them. Yes, they have some struggles with ideas about the second coming of Christ, but their influence just about puts the apostles out of business. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, he says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God is spread abroad so that we don't have to say anything. For they themselves show of us what type of entering in we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. These Thessalonians who Paul and Silas had preached to in Acts 17, their lives had changed so radically that Paul and the apostles say, listen, we, we're about out of a job. We can't even go and preach to people because they themselves show of us how you've changed. And your change from idolatry to the worship of the true God has had such an impact that it's spread all throughout Achaia. And we have the same influence today. You may think that nobody follows me. I, I, I don't do anything. I don't have an influence, but you do. It's right there in your hands. God has given you the power, given me the power to touch other people's lives. And we ought to use it to his glory. Much like Moses, who thought he simply had a useless rod in his hand, but it shaped the nation of Israel. Our influence will change our lives and the lives of others for the better or for the worse. The Bible says a lot about people that have influence. In 1 Peter 3, you read about a woman, and Peter says, now, if any of you have husbands that don't believe, you go ahead and submit, because they may be one without a word. What if he won't come and hear a sermon? What if he won't be converted by a gospel meeting? Peter says, he may without a word be won over by the godly conduct of their wives. A woman can't be an elder in the church, can't get up and preach a sermon. She may be able to do something that those individuals in those positions will never do. And how does she do that? Peter says it's her influence. Look at 1 Peter 3, 15, this same chapter where Peter says, now wives have an influence. Peter says this is true about every individual in the church. 1 Peter 3, 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Peter says, be ready to give an answer. Now, we often focus on that second part of that verse, which says, be ready to give an answer for people that question you about what, what you believe, and rightfully so. But notice what Peter says before that. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That is, live a consecrated life, and people will be impressed by that, and they will say, would you talk to me about what you believe? Now, if we just focus on the part about stockpiling answers, which is a good thing, and apologetics, well, that's great, but nobody is asking the question, if I don't live in such a way, that would prompt them to want to investigate more about who I am. Peter says, get this in the right order. You live the life, and then be ready, because it's coming. Peter doesn't say if it happens. He says, if you live this life, you just prepare yourself. The questions will come. People will say, why do you have that hope? What do you call that? It's called influence. The apostles couldn't be everywhere all the time, and so they would go a place, preach, establish a congregation, and as Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, you are our letter of recommendation. You are written epistles known and read of all men in our hearts. The Corinthians were the divine advertisement for the apostles' ministry. They were blasphemers and persecutors and homosexuals, and Paul says, look at how much you've changed. Is the gospel true? Does the gospel work? Look at my work with the Corinthians. And Paul would say to us today, you have influence in your hands. It's 1985, and it's a New York Times article about members of the Church of Christ. Two, one Frank and his wife, Elizabeth Morris. Their daughter died in a car crash because a man was drunk driving, 26 years old. Tommy Piggage was his name, hit their daughter, and she died immediately. And Frank and Elizabeth say in the New York Times article that's titled, Fat A Fatality and Forgiveness. They say, we wanted him dead, no doubt about it. We hated him. We couldn't forgive him. We were angry about what he had done. And he, he tried to clean himself up, but at different court cases, they found that he continued to drink and he would lie about different things. And finally, Mr. Tommy landed himself in jail at 26, and they were happy and satisfied with that. But Mr. Frank said, you know what? 
there was one life lost because of this DUI. There doesn't have to be two. And so he went and visited Tommy and did what he could to try to influence him in the right way. And Tommy got out of jail and Mr. Frank continued to visit and try to be a good influence around him. And one day he obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mr. Frank baptized him into Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. What do you call that? You would say, that's called influence. Be kind, tenderhearted to one another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, Ephesians 4.32. It's what Frank and Elizabeth practiced. They didn't let him off scot-free. He had to pay his debt to society for the wrong he'd done. But they said, you know what? We're not going to let his wrong make us bitter. We're going to be kind and good to him, and hopefully it'll change him. And it did. And they became not enemies, but they became brethren. And Jesus says, look at the times in which you live. As dark as it is right now for Christians, we ought to be able to shine some light. Have you ever thought about this soberly, that people will spend eternity in either heaven or hell based on the way that you and I behave? It's a sober reality. I know everyone will give account of himself to God. That's true. Scripture teaches that. But there is a sense in which the way that we interact with people, the impression we leave on them, we either draw them closer to Christianity or repel them. And it ought to cause us to stop and give pause and say, what type of influence am I being? Long after he was dead, Hebrews 11 and verse 4 says about Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than that of Cain. And his works testified that he was righteous. God gave witness to that. And he being dead still speaks. Thousands of years after Abel's death, the Bible says his influence echoed down throughout the chambers of time. Revelation 14, 13 says that's true about Christians. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow them. That is, your influence will outlive you, and so will mine. So will it be for good or for bad? What's that in your hand? It's influence. And may we use it in a way that people say, we've heard the Lord is on your side, like in the book of Zechariah, and we'll go with you. When they saw the apostles spoke with boldness in Acts 4 and verse 13, they took knowledge of those folks and they said, now these people have been with Jesus. He spoke like that. He behaved like that when under pressure. And Peter and John, they've been with him and we know it. And they overwhelmed the Roman Empire, not with might or money or fancy preachers. It's with the power of the gospel and their godly influence. It didn't last long, but appreciate that the early church had the favor of all the people, Acts 2.47. People just appreciated what they did, and we can do that today. Number next, what's that in your hand? Is there sin? Turn your Bible to Isaiah 59 for this one. Isaiah 59, now we normally quote verses 1 and 2 when we talk about sin separating a man from God, and that's right, but notice what Isaiah says and how he links this. A lot of times in Scripture, the hands are used to represent the entire person. And whether a person's hands are pure or not determine whether or not the individual is. And so Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he can't save, neither is his ear heavy that he can't hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hid his face that he will not hear. And then he says, Your hands are defiled with blood. Goes on to talk about the fingers, the lips, and even the tongue. He says, Listen, you're defiled. Do we have sin in our hands? Maybe you think it's private. Nobody knows about this. This is my own personal and private thing with God. But God knows about it. Do I have it in my hands? The Bible speaks of a man cleaning himself up or a woman cleaning herself up in such a way that she can come before the Lord with holy hands. In James 4 and verse 8, he says, You draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He wasn't talking about the pharisaical ritual of washing hands. He's saying, clean up your life so that you can lift your hands to God in purity of service, and they won't be defiled. That's how the book of Isaiah begins. In Isaiah 1, about verse 15, he says, You lift your hands to me in prayer, and your hands are defiled with blood. And come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. God says, I will clean up your hands, but only if you release the sin. God's sovereign and all-powerful. But he won't wrestle the sin from our lives that we so desperately cling to and say, no, I want to hold on to this. I want to do this. I want to practice this. I want to live this way. God says, if it means that much to you, you can have it. Look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24 and verse 3. And this same idea the psalmist speaks about making sure that the hands are clean 
and that the life is pure. Psalm 24 and verse 3. It says, Who will ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who will stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. It's like kids, you know, sometimes they'll play a game or they'll pose a question to one and the one has his hands behind his back with his fingers crossed. You know what that means? That means I'm joking, this isn't serious. And maybe we might think that way about our own personal, well, so long as the church folks don't know I'm engaged in this practice and it's a private matter between me, I can get this by God. But what is that in your hand? If it is sin, Jesus says, turn it over to me. The way God works is this way. If we confess it, God will conceal it and forgive it. But if we conceal it, God will one day expose it, and we would have outrun God's forgiveness. Proverbs 28, 13 says, The person that confesses sin and forsakes it, that individual finds mercy. God's going to judge every secret work, everything. Hebrews 4, 13 says, All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do business. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14 says, He's going to bring every work into the judgment. That's not a fearful thing for the Christian. Because we've lived an open life before God, and as we've made mistakes, we've confessed those sins to God, and the blood that cleanses us at baptism continues to cleanse as we walk in Jesus' light. It's funny, the very thing that stains the Christian life, the stain of sin, God says, I can cleanse that with blood. You remember Pilate in Matthew 27, in verse 24, he tries to wash his hands of Jesus' guilt. He's going to send a guilty man to execution, and he tries to wash his hands of sin, but he's still guilty. And in verse 25 of Matthew 27, the crowd on that day, they say what a lot of people say today. They don't realize it, but they say these words. His blood be on us and on our children. That is, we don't care about the guilt of being guilty of his murder. We'll take it ourselves. And sometimes people use similar terminology today. You say to an individual, now scripture teaches you must be immersed for the forgiveness of sins. You can't have it any other way. And people think somehow they're going to go to the judgment bar of God with sin in their hands, uncleansed and unclothed in Christ, and surely God's going to give me a pass. God's going to let me by. You say you need to be a member of the New Testament church. You're baptized in water. God takes care of the sin problem. He also takes care of the church issue. He doesn't leave it up to you to go and join one. He adds you to his son's church. And people say, I'm not worried about that. I know God's going to forgive me. And we say, why don't we just go back to the New Testament way? Be buried with him in baptism, allow him to cleanse the sin, and let's become a member of the church of his choice. What is that in your hand? Is there sin? Number next, it's time in your hand. We do have time in our hand in a limited sense. Now, God has all time. It all belongs to God, but he's given us a portion of it, at least a limited amount of time in our hands. You think about the passages in scripture that speak of God's eternality. But as it relates to us as God's people, we enjoy a limited time. Now, we don't have tomorrow. We don't have yesterday. We don't even have a full day. We really are limited. We're captive to the moment that we currently possess. We don't know what the next moment will hold, but God's put it in our hands. Proverbs 27 and verse 1, Solomon said, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day will bring forth. We don't know what the next moment will hold. Our lives are described in James 4 and verse 14 as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. But we do have time in our hands for a short while. What are you going to do with the time? How about you just go, go ahead and write that note you've been planning to? Why don't you look your children in the eye and tell them how much they mean to you, how much you appreciate them? What if you right now just made your marriage a foretaste of heaven? What if you just stop wasting time and thinking, oh, I, I have tomorrow? The calendar of the Bible always reads today. Scripture is always telling individuals to make the changes, to make the relationships right, to repent and do the right thing now because tomorrow is fantasy land. Nobody lives in tomorrow because by the time tomorrow comes, it's what? It's today. And so 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Hebrews 4 and verse 7, heart and not your heart, respond to the Lord today because that's all we have in our hands is today. The Bible says that God is from everlasting to what? Everlasting, that's right. You're not, now, every one of us is to everlasting, but we're not from it. We have a beginning point, but we will live eternally in one of two places, but we are finite creatures with a limited amount of time. 
the psalmist says, Lord, teach me to remember how short my time is. Psalm 89, 47. Later on, the next Psalm 90 and verse 12, Moses says, teach us to apply our hearts to wisdom and to number our days. Do you know how short your time is? We have these watches and phones and clocks and all types of things, and we'll still say something like this. I lost track of what? I lost track of time. We really didn't lose track of time. You know, we say time is moving so fast. It's really not time, but it's humanity running through the time. Time has always moved at the same pace. You say, where did all the time go? Exactly where we put it. Whatever we did with the time. Everybody has the same amount of time in a day to do what we want, and will we use it to his glory? Everybody knows who lived the longest in the Bible, but the question is, what did he accomplish? Josiah lived a very limited amount of time, and he glorified God with it. It's not how long you live, somebody says. It's how strong you live. What do you do with that life? What do you use it for? What's that in your hand? It's time. Two more. Number six. What's that in your hand? Hopefully, it's the sword of the Spirit. Maybe we take this for granted, that we have this book. We've been carrying them around. We have them on tablets and phones. And just we might think that everybody in every place has a copy of God's Word, and that's just not the case. There are language groups throughout the world that don't have a copy of God's Word. Now, there are people at this hour working on that to try to bring the Scriptures to people in their native language, but there are some people in some places, they don't have John 3.16. They don't have Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. Now, missionaries can go and preach to those folks, and they are people that can translate, for, but they don't have this. Do we make the most of it? Psalm 119, 176 verses dedicated to praising and blessing God for his word. In that psalm, Psalm 119 and verse 161, the psalmist says, I stand in awe of your word. Do you? Do we? Do we still stand in awe of it? The fact that God created us and this infinite God that created us went out of his way or went to make sure that he could communicate to us and had men to write the word of God down and preserve it so that at this very hour we can open it up and read of his love for us. Paul described the Christian armor in Ephesians 6. And in verse 13, he says, if you want to be able to stand against the wiles or the strategies of the devil, you're going to have to have a good handle on scripture. And the last thing that he mentions, he says, you take for hope the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What did Jesus fight Satan with? Three times in Matthew 4, he says, it is written, it is written, it is written again. No miraculous. And he would often use miraculous power throughout his ministry. He didn't run from the devil. Be impressed with the fact that Scripture never tells God's people to run from the devil. Now, there are passages like 1 Corinthians six eighteen, flee fornication, flee youthful lust. But the Bible never says if the devil attacks you, you run from him. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's the cowardly one. He will turn in the other direction and run because he can't withstand this. But do we have it in our hand? Did you study this this week? I mean, do we look at this book? Is this just something that sort of sits around and we just say, well, I know my Bible. I have it on my phone. I have this app and, and I'll get around to studying my Bible one day. What's that in your hand? Is it the sword of the spirit? If Jesus used the word of God to defeat Satan, how do we think we're going to stand a chance against him if we say, well, I, I didn't get around to it. It's not really that important to me. The Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, 105 says... Man shall not live by what? By bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, people try to prove Jesus wrong about that every day. Jesus says, you can't live without this. And people say to Jesus, oh, I can. I haven't read my Bible in 20, 20 days. I can survive. Jesus says, you won't really live and enjoy life. You won't live by bread alone. But do I have the sword of the Spirit in my hand? Am I becoming acquainted with God's word? Do I know it? Do I hide it in my heart so that I might not sin against him? Do I read it and study it and try to share it with other people? Because this is what's going to make the difference. Every sin, every weakness is attached to a lack of Bible knowledge. You think of the sin, every one of them. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You say, well, I want the church to grow. It's going to grow because we build on the Bible. What's that in your hand? Is it the sword of the spirit? This is God's weapon of choice. The gospel is called the power of God unto salvation. If we want to succeed spiritually, it'll be as we have a healthy handle and relationship on God's word.
It's more than just rote memorization and saying, well, I know a few facts, but it's reading what God's word has said and then putting it into practice. James says, don't deceive yourself. We're not spiritual just because we listen to the word of God. Don't be simply hearers of the word, but also be doers. And I need to be someone that has a handle on scripture and I have the sword of the spirit in my hand. And then in the last place in the time we have remaining, what's that in your hand? It's your own soul. God has the whole world in his hands, but you have your soul in yours. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached the first gospel sermon, and those men were pricked in their heart in verse 37 after Peter told them, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God made him both Lord and Christ. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you remember Peter's response in verse 38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and this promises to you, your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then verse 40 says, with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. I thought God saves us. Well, he does. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace through faith that we're saved. God shows his grace to us and we respond in faith and we accept that salvation. We turn from sin, but there is a sense in which we save ourselves. And that's what Peter was saying to that multitude. Save yourselves because your eternal salvation, it rests in your hands. It's not some predetermined thing by God where he has sifted out humanity into two groups, the saved and the damned, and there's nothing we can do about it. Peter says, you can change it right now. There are people later on in the book of Acts. In Acts 13 and verse 46, they say to Paul and Barnabas, we don't want the gospel. And you remember what Paul said? Seeing that you've thrust the word of God from you and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Why didn't they have eternal life? Because God didn't want them to have it? Because they weren't elect? No, Paul says, you did it to yourself. God wants everybody to be saved. That's why the sun rose this morning, 2 Peter 3, 9. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but the only person that can change that for me is me. God wants me to be saved, but I have to want it just as bad. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Philippians 2 and verse 12 says to Christians, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because your soul is in your hands. Do you believe that? That it's up to you, where you're going to spend eternity is largely in part based on what you do. We can't earn it. We don't work to earn it, but we work in response for what God's done. Nobody will be saved without doing anything. Jesus says, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus says, you can forfeit it. You can give it up. You don't have to, but it's in your hands and that's your decision. In Exodus chapter four, God appears to Moses and Moses doesn't know it. He doesn't know he's going to do great things with his hands. And God says, as he makes excuse after excuse on why he can't be profitable and all of the things that are going to come up and that are going to hinder him. Exodus 4 and verse 2 is the question of this hour. And it's the question for the rest of our lives. What is that in your hand? What do you have? What do you possess? And there are a host of things that we possess. Moses said, I have a rod. And God says, take it and change the world. What do you have in your hand? You have talent. You have treasures, you have ability, you have influence, and God says in your sphere of influence, in your life, in the area in which you live, do marvelous things with it, with divine power backing you to accomplish it and do it. It's important what we have in our hands, but it's also important that God has us in his. So Ephesians 3 and verse 17, Paul said that Christ would dwell in your heart by faith, and you being rooted and grounded in love, you'd be able to comprehend the things that God wants you to. Because if God has us in his hands and we do the right things in ours, we, like Moses, can change the world. What's in your hand? It's whatever we put there and keep there, and we can do it to his glory. Thanks for your attention this afternoon.